the sound is what created all. Sound created the universe. This is synchronicity. 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 Welcome to episode 97 of Synchronicity. My guest this week is Alexandre Tanus, and Alexandre is a professor, a researcher, a teacher, a musician, uh, a student of life, of spirit, just a totally awesome guy. Big doff of the cap to Michael. Doff of the cap? <laughs> what am I? I've never used that term before, and I definitely am not going to use it again. Sorry for that. But thank you to Michael Philip from Third Eye Drops for recommending that I have Alexandre on. You will hear why in this episode. I'm not going to break the whole thing down, but let's just say this. If you're interested in sound, if you're interested in music, if you're interested in mysticism, if you're interested in the broad blanket spirituality moniker, this is a really great episode. We get pretty nerdy about sound at some point, but also get pretty esoteric about uh, how this stuff really can work. And, you know, whether you've gone out to clubs or see your favorite band or a concert hall or just listen in your headphones, which I like to do, get a nice pair of headphones, uh, it, it's undeniable that sound has and music have a dramatic impact on our day to day lives. I know there is rarely a day where music is not heard by me in my life. And when I find that it's been a few days, I'm usually in a bad mood. So there's a lot of stuff to this. Yes, there's the emotional components of music that can resonate with us. Um, you know, there's the pleasurable entertainment aspects, but there's also, also this deeper level, um, which Alexandre mentions very early on, which is Many of the religious and mystic and philosophical traditions refer to sound as kind of being the primordial start to this reality. Um, and you could say that's a coincidence. You could say whatever you want, but it's true. Uh, so that should hold some weight. It does for me. I also know that in my life, um, making music, listening to music, discussing music, um, sounds, making sounds, you know, having a kid really teaches us. They make weird sounds. I have some really fucking weird sounds coming out of my kid's mouth, uh, but it's really funny, and sometimes it's cool, and sometimes it's cute, and all of these things carry some energy to them. So we really get deep into that in this episode, which is uh, really a treat for me. Uh, so I think I'm going to keep this intro very short. Again, I'm getting carried away at times. Uh, I want to get right to it. I think I'm going to start rolling out some other things for people who want to support uh, on Patreon. I'm going to do some recommendations, going to do some music recommendations, some book recommendations, some show recommendations, um, and also some other exciting and fun things. So you can go check that out on patreon.com slash synchronicity. I'm going to probably stop mentioning that every show. If you want to find out anything that's going on related to this, syncpodcast.com, that's the best place to go. I want to thank everyone who has joined the Facebook community recently. That's been going great. Uh, the email list, uh, I manage the community there. People are really tuning in and uh, writing with some great synchronicities. Always love to hear about those. Noah at Sync Podcast, if you just want to shoot me an email. Uh, things are going great. I, I don't know if I mentioned this this month, but we are continuing to break every record for downloads uh, every single month for the past three or four months. Um, and that's awesome. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you're the best, basically, for listening. I don't know if you're first time, long time, whatever you are, whatever type of listener, are, know that you are fucking awesome. Uh, so I think we'll get right to the episode. How about that? Without further ado, here is Alexandre Tanus.
Thank you again for coming on. I'm super excited uh, for so many reasons. You sent me some of these questions beforehand um, just to get a sense of maybe some of the things we could speak about. And as I was saying before we were rolling, um, <laughs> every single one that I was reading was like, yes, yes, yes. Just so you know, one of my favorite books ever, um, I've recommended mm -hmm. it to countless people, is The Mysticism of Sound and Music by mm -hmm. Hazrat Inayat Khan. And I, yes. I just, oh, incredible. So I, I also, just so you have some background on who I am, I went to a music school. I graduated from Berkeley. Um, and it's just always been a tremendous kind of tool and modality that I've used in my life, not only uh, for pleasure and enjoyment, but also as a spiritual practice. So, you know, just looking at the tremendous work you've been doing over the years and your focus on sound and ethnomusicology, um, philosophy and how these things intersect, I'm just incredibly grateful to have you on. Thank you. And great to hear about your background. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, saving it as a treat. So, I think let's let, let's start maybe with your background and how you kind of got pulled into the world of sound. Like where where in your life did that start uh, as a child, as uh, beginning to try to kind of form your persona in the world? Where how has sound been linked um, in your life? Hmm, it's a long story, but I've had great interest in music since I was a child, and eventually started studying it and. Um, um, it basically uh, modulated from one thing to another, from the normal interest in music to eventually going to college and studying various um, aspects of music. Um, I did eventually four degrees in music over 12 years, uh, mm -hmm. studied double major in music theory and composition, and I performed a lot. And uh, <clears throat> uh, from there onward, I, I did uh, three master's degrees in uh, music education and ethnomusicology, and mm. I was doing PhD and um, didn't end up by finishing it because it had been twelve straight years. And I also realized that <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I wasn't that interested in academia. I became interested in uh, an area that uh, no one is studying, which is the the es esoteric and therapeutic properties of sound. This mm. is something that emerged after having done a variety of different things in music, from playing to composing contemporary classical music and film music and playing different musical styles and eventually different musical cultures, teaching, conducting, doing research. And after having done years of fieldwork in over 40 countries, mm. I, I became deeper and deeper interested in, <laughs> in something, as I said, no one's looking at. And eventually that one over and, and I dropped everything I was doing before, even though I <laughs> loved it. And I focused on this area and um, I ended up by learning the most important things about music that no one is teaching, unfortunately, and um, no one is researching. And mm. I became a sound researcher and sound therapist. And I feel that the, the world really needs it. There's a great interest in sound mm. and it's a, uh, going in a naturalando and crescendo, but um, people don't fully understand it. They're drawn to it, uh, but they don't fully understand it. I mean, I've been studying it for years and I don't fully understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's the kind of uh, thing we're talking about. So uh, now I'm all focused on these two aspects, the research and working with people. And I keep on coming out with uh, new findings and what I do now is a combination of uh, working with people, transmitting the practice, doing more research and field work. I'm writing a book. I um, do recordings, various recordings. I did six recordings recently. Uh, they're still not up yet for download. Eventually, they will be, but people can get in touch with me mm. uh, and then <clears throat> they came personally directly from me. Uh, my website is soundmeditation.com, but yeah. there are some uh, recordings on it that they can access. Uh, they're actually on SoundCloud. I was listening today. It. Yeah, I was listening mm -hmm. today. It's some really cool <clears throat> stuff, the Tibetan bowls in particular. Um, yeah. Really cool. And I'm actually doing a recording right now. It's just I was until late last night uh, doing 
studio session and I'll be going in the afternoon as well with Lisa Fisher, who's an amazing singer. She used to be the lead backup vocalist for the Rolling Stones. So oh, cool. her and I are doing um, uh, recording for, you know, meditation and spiritual uh, purposes, but sincere, you know, and yes. that's part well, of what's out there. Let's talk about this kind of area that people aren't really studying and focusing on yet still has been spoken about even in the mystical traditions for for millennia, truthfully, of how sound is typically thought of as the primordial beginning of what we experience as physical reality. And we also know that sound has an impact physically on us um, and you know, even more into the realm of things like binaural beats or certain frequencies can actually in evoke changes in our neurochemistry, um, which is a fancy way, I guess, of asking what what are some of the most illuminating things you've discovered in your years of researching sound and kind of getting into the more esoteric um, elements of it, which I personally find uh, fascinating. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, but anyone who doesn't, you know, hasn't read the mysticism and sound and music, um, you don't have to take everything as gospel in there, but there are some incredible um, expositions on how sound can function um, mm -hmm. and on us. So yeah, I mean, what what have you discovered? What is like some like mind blowing thing that you're like, oh my god? Or what 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 was something that was like, I found this here and there, and all these things seem to line up. I'm sure there's been many of those instances. Yes, there are so many. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the 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 biggest one. <clears throat> is that, uh, and that's not coming from me, but I'm starting to agree with it more and more that um, in every, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm suffering from allergies today. That's okay. Um, in every religion, uh, philosophy, we arrive to uh, something quite significant. Hmm which is uh, the fact that sound is what created all. Right. Sound created the universe. Uh, whether in ah, Christianity, the first, gospel, the first sentence in the Gospel of John, in the beginning there was the Word, and right. the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right. Um, that's reference to the concept of Logos in ancient Greece. Um, sound... Uh, or the word is a sound. Right. And in Hinduism and Buddhism, we have not a sentence uh, that we often hear and don't interpret it well. The universe started with the primordial Om. Right. In ancient Egypt, they tell us the universe started with a song. Mm. Also in Hinduism, we have the concept of Akasha and Spanda movement or vibration. Um, so uh, uh, also in Hinduism, uh, Nada Brahma, right. the world, the sound. Right. So if sound created the universe, then sound can be perceived as God. <laughs> right. Uh, these are, this is one of the biggest findings that sound is God. Well, mm -hmm. How can we wrap <laughs> our hand, head around it? Also in Kabbalah, um, you have the Tetragrammaton, which is right. the unpronounceable name of God. Um, I believe, and also another good friend of mine who is a scholar who has been studying the biblical texts and their interpretation and uh, the esoteric properties of sound and how one has to use uh, mathematics to understand these texts and sound is mathematics, right. it's mathematical ratios. So the conclusion in the Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of creation, the only book attributed to Abraham, the patriarch, mm. the, uh, the harmonic series is the living God. Mm. So the connection between mathematics and sound is also another huge revelation. And to really understand sound, one has to go into mathematics because sound and music, the reason why they're powerful um, is because there are mathematical ratios and, mm. and intelligence manifests in various mathematical systems in nature, such as the Fibonacci series and the phi or the golden mean, the golden ratio and its significance, which right. is immense. 
And it's something that physicists, mathematicians, philosophers, and many others have deeply observed in its intricacies and how it's at uh, the root core of everything. It's the constant of the universe, right. if we can say. And um, other mathematical systems are fractal geometry. So the, the harmonic overtone series is the most important one. And that's the one um, that impacts everything, all musical cultures, harmonic right. systems, scales, and modes all come out of the harmonic series, and it's encoded in us. Mm -hmm. So, the reason why this system is found in nature is to give any sound its tone color or timbre, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly complex. And coincidentally, um, this is what um, all sound practitioners, whether in native or in an indigenous setting or in contemporary setting, uh, people end up using instruments that emit harmonic overtones to clearly audible levels, such as gongs, singing bowls, discs, bells, shruti boxes, harmoniums, yes. overtone singing. All of these instruments um, produce harmonic overtones to clearly audible level. When they're found in any sound that we listen to, um, it's important for us to hear them directly and not in a concealed way. Hmm. Because when we listen to various sounds uh, of various instruments, uh, voices, or sounds in nature, the fundamental frequency, the most mm -hmm. pronounced mm -hmm. part of the sound, is more dominant and overshadows these overtones. Hmm. Only when we start to hear them, like the way we hear them on a on a gong or when one plays singing bowl or crystal bowl, um, we hear these harmonics, these frequencies, and that changes everything. Yes. What we're basically listening to, we're listening to the audible side of mathematics. <laughs> and mathematics is the source code in the universe. And Plato, Aristotle, and um, Pythagoras confirmed that as well. Right. And if those three are agreeing on something, yeah, yeah. then you should pay attention because uh -huh. they didn't always agree. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I mean, and this is a fascinating kind of exploration into not only the fundamental basis potentially of the universe, but especially for sound, but mathematics in general. I mean, I, I've referenced this many different times on this podcast, but Marie-Louise von Franz, one of Carl Jung's, his main translator and a, a great academic in her own right, um, mm -hmm. often referred to number as the primordial archetype yes. superseding everything. That is actually what we look at. I mean, we don't typically think of numbers like that because we use them quantitatively, but mm -hmm. qualitatively, they can also have resonance both conceptually and physically and spiritually in all the ways we can mention. So I think this would be a cool place to talk about kind of the differences between non-Western harmonic systems and Western systems. And I know a little bit about this, but explain it to me as though I know nothing. I was lucky enough, like I said, when at Berkeley, I had Indian music mm. classes, Indian music synthesis classes, learned a few uh, ragas, some tintal. So I have some basis of how these things differ microtonally. But maybe if you could, I'm using you as an amazing and immense resource here, um, kind of elucidate some of the differences between the non-Western systems, harmonic systems, and the Western ones. I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear about mm -hmm. that. Sure. Um, I'm going to stick to basics because we yeah. can get quite convoluted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so let's start with the octave. The octave is the distance between one frequency and the doubling of that frequency. Right. If you take the note C, for example... Um, and let's pretend that the C has a frequency, and it's frequency that measured using hertz, which is cycles per second. Right. And let's say it's 200 hertz. So if you keep raising the pitch until you get to 400 hertz, this is where the note C is doubled. Right. And its frequency becomes 400 hertz. So it will be, um, if, if you were to sing... The scale C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, C, C. That's an octave right. for people who are not familiar with music. Um, so it's the same repetition of the note, but in different octaves. Could be an octave higher, two octaves higher, four octaves higher, or several octaves lower. So um, 
the magic is between the, the two notes mm -hmm. that constitute an octave. Um, and in various cultures, this distance has been divided in different numbers of right. divisions. In the Western world, it's divided into 12 semitones, or let's call them 12 tones. And the tone, the, the smallest division of sound in the Western world, is the half step, which right. is the distance between the black key and the adjacent white key on a piano, or difference, the distance between one fret and the next fret up on a guitar or the next fret down on a guitar. Right. So uh, that would be C to C sharp, C sharp to D, so on and so forth. Now in the West... Our chromatic scale, yeah. Chromatic scale, exactly. Yes. So in the West we ended up by dividing this distance into 12 equidistant half steps. And that became the equal temperament, which is the act that castrated the octave. Yes, and, and yep. I'm taking particular note that you are using the term castrated, right? That, yeah, yeah. It disempowered it. <laughs> yes. We lost the state of trance and euphoria of ecstasy. Why? Because by creating an equidistant division between all 12 half steps when before the equal temperament they were not all equal let's say western music was 12 half steps and not all octaves are divided into 12 half steps but i'm getting to that in a bit right. um we are no longer following the mathematics that nature gave us and they're encoded in us and the octave is divided into 1200 cents a cent is a unit that's used for logarithmic measurement for sound. Mm -hmm. um, and if the octave is equal to 1200 cents and we divide it into 12 equidistant half steps, naturally each half step is going to be 100 cents. When before the equal temperament, these half steps were not all 100 cents. Some may be 100 cents, some 98 cents, mm -hmm. or 96, and some 104, 102. And um, in other cultures, especially non-Western cultures, this octave is divided into greater number of divisions. Uh, take Indian classical music, for right, example. Right. There are 22 shrutis. So you have the swaras, which are the notes, and the shrutis that are the notes between the notes. Right. So they, they divide the octave into 22 different notes that one can use. <clears throat> So there, there's a greater level of minutia in Arabic and Persian musics, which are ancient musical cultures. <clears throat> they, they divide the octave into 24 uh, tones. Right. In Turkish music, it's 53. In uh, Byzantine music, which is the music of the Eastern Church in Orthodoxy. Um, so in Christianity, we have uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy. Um, they divide the octave into 72 tones. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. So, um, but these various numbers and divisions of octave come from the complexity of the overtones. Mm -hmm. If we look at the overtone series and the tuning of the notes found in the series, we found that all of them fluctuate except for the fundamental frequency. And every time it repeats in the series, mm. people can look at harmonic series on Wikipedia, let's say, and they see that there are varying numbers over these harmonics, plus two, right, mi right. minus 14, minus 49. All of these things are measuring <clears throat> the deviation in cents. Um, so all of the notes deviate except for the fundamental frequency and every time it repeats in the octave. And that means these notes that deviate, you cannot play uh, on and match them correctly on a perfectly tuned piano in equal temperament. Right, right. So they're a little bit higher or dramatically higher or lower. So this is a tuning that we're no longer following. Mm. The complex mathematics there are in nature. And as I said earlier, sound is mathematical ratios that we're listening to and the reason why sound has a great impact on uh, everything of who we are, whether on the mental, emotional, spiritual, energetic, physical levels. Uh, music is powerful because 
it it tempers the way we perceive reality. Right. Right. Which That's what mathematics do. Yeah. I mean, which is obvious, even if you don't understand anything about that, you know, just listening to a song <laughs> can change your mind or emotional state is proof of it an- alone. And I also find this fascinating about the microtonal stuff. I'm a big, uh, my major at school was music synthesis, which is a mm-hmm. very weird way of saying I got to use various, you know, state of the art synthesizers and DAWs mm-hmm. and, you know, ways to use modern technology. And one of the things I really enjoyed about it um, is the ability to shift things around, you know, use yes. um, semitone shifts and use microtonal shifts. Um, it's very interesting because some of the music I like the most in the electronic world is not like dissonant per se. It's still very structured and falls within the parameters of the Western things. But you'll hear mm-hmm. drifting drones. You'll hear changing things that sweep through different microtones or scents. And I never really thought of it as having a direct application to some of these um, more ancient or mystical or uh, older, really, um, ways of breaking down music. So, like, what what are some of the um, – trying to figure out the right way to phrase this. What are some of the techniques or benefits of some of these different systems of harmony, harmonic systems in different cultures? Like, where would you pinpoint a few that are kind of interesting and you're like, wow, this is a way that they're – actually using this in a practical sense and these are the functions that we've kind of uh cut ourselves off from Mm -hmm. um this is a great question so um as we start to study these ancient musical uh systems that have been around for who knows how long we realize that um this sophistication comes from a point in the past where there was a great knowledge of right. sound, of mathematics, and consciousness that they devised uh, musical systems, harmonic systems, that, uh, that are used not just for entertainment or the way we use music nowadays, but as a system for spiritual maintenance, mm-hmm. therapy, and other modalities all at once in system that are perceived nowadays as mostly part of the art right realm. right but it's not necessarily so it's it they're very very complex however so basically uh we listen to music <clears throat> for a variety of different reasons and this is why music is so versatile uh, it's used even nowadays <clears throat> in religious ceremonies in indigenous ceremonies, in all shamanic ceremonies, um, and various other realms, really. Um, so it's uh, it's malleable, it's flexible, it's, uh, it has a function, and that function varies depending on the mm. intention and the will mm. of the individual. <laughs> uh, but what it does, it reveals consciousness. Yes. Music and sound is a system that we intuitively, subconsciously gravitate toward and use and create various systems to unlock consciousness, to connect us to the higher self, to help us understand who we are Mm, 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 mm. and to elevate our consciousness. And I'm not exaggerating. If if people go deep into the therapeutic and the esoteric side of music and how it's used in indigenous setting and the various things that people do with music, whether instrumental music, vocal music, or the dance that's result of the music right. and the reverence and, you know, the spirits that people talk about when they play music. And of course, you know, we need to do a lot of translation when, when we're listening to, let's say, indigenous people talking about the various spirits that right. music have, uh, such as in Gnawa music, music for healing and trance in North Africa, or uh, the various uh, songs that are used in different shamanic ceremonies, let's say the Ikaros in ayahuasca right, ceremonies right. and so on. So basically, uh, we are talking about something that is so incomprehensible for us, and it's very <laughs> important not to take things literally and that's what people do unfortunately because then this is where dogma is gonna 
right. uh, happen. And we don't want dogmas. We need to use all of the sciences, all of our faculties to really understand, to decode something so immense that um, it can accommodate an infinite number of ways of talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at the end, um, sound impacts our emotional state through something that's called the ethos. Sound has an ethos. Mm -hmm. Ethos is a word in ancient Greek, which can be best translated as the describing character, the personality, the, the spirit. Right. It's one of the 25 definitions of spirit. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, and um, yeah, the way it evokes emotions within us and moves us. But there are layers involved here and, and it's very important so the equal temperament is one so if mm. we're listening to music that's equal tempered we shouldn't expect magic music can still be beautiful right. all music in the west is played on equal tempered instruments uh, or equal tempered scales and harmonic uh, system so we need to use a system that's not incapacitated that's not quantized like the right, Western. Right. I'm not putting it down. I'm just saying right. that it can be better. It's wonderful what we've created in, in Western music, the various styles. However, uh, we lost the state of trance, mm -hmm. the ecstasy, the euphoria, the enchantment. And this is why I believe that people started using drugs in raves yes. in various yes. contexts because music no longer takes them there. Well, I have a very interesting uh, interjection at that point. So I, um, started getting into house music and underground house music back in the late nineties. I was between the ages of 16 and 18. I was really getting into it. And I used to go to clubs. Mm -hmm. I used to say, well, I didn't say I, I did. I, I, you know, got my way into writing for a Dutch music magazine that covered club events. So I got press passes and I got to go into these clubs well before I was able to smoke, drink, take drugs, didn't know anyone. I'm going alone. And mm -hmm. I would be there until 8 and 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. I knew people were taking drugs. I didn't really get the full extent of it until much later in my years of going out. But mm. um, the truth of it is, is I found there to be an energy that I didn't feel everyone else was aware of that was coming through this music. But I did notice some people felt that they had to have some altered state of consciousness going in to fully appreciate it. Um, I get that. I'm I'm an avid cannabis user. I one of my favorite things to do is you know in and consume cannabis and listen to music. I totally get the appeal of altering your state of consciousness. I also, this is, this is an area I am fascinated in talking to you, talking with you about, because to me, the, what we're communicating here via sound, via our voices, via music, via uh, tonalities, whatever it is, is what you alluded to before, the intention, the idea, the resonance, the full spiritual force of what is being communicated beyond the sound that that is before it and i think that can come through in any music we listen to even even tempered but i think what you're getting at which is something that i have certainly experienced when i've gone to certain sound teaching modality things um is that there is a whole other level that not only can induce pleasure and beauty and uh, ecstasy but really transcendent states really physically shifting almost i mean the way i would describe it i went to a particular sound healing thing um in new york city and it was about six hours with a, a half an hour 45 minute break in between um tom Kenyon was the guy and he has all these crystal bowls and all these things and uh, an incredible like four and a half five octave voice just absurdly low to absurdly high and you constantly are opening your eyes to see if this is the same person making these sounds and what i'll never forget about it is after about five six hours of this walking out of the place in the Upper West Side of Manhattan and feeling like, truthfully, I had just taken a heavy dose of mushrooms, smoked a ton of weed. Like I was viscerally and palpably elated. I felt like I was floating. And that, to me, unlocked a different layer of this that I had never really experienced with sound before. So I would love to hear kind of your take on all of these different things and how we can use sound in much more of the way we're, we're accustomed to either listening to music or they're hearing things in our daily lives or just kind of building a relationship with sound in a different way. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, yeah, well, so basically uh, 
what you went through is um, an experience that allowed your body to vibrate in resonance right. to the music that was being played because the human body is the most sophisticated instrument hmm. on all levels. Um, and healing is reinstating a state of resonance, hmm. is allowing self-healing to take place. Hmm. That's something we as Westerners, we need to learn so, so much about. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that we call healers healers hmm. instead of healing facilitators, hmm. that communicates to us a lot hmm. that... <clears throat> you know, we think that healers really heal us. No, healers do very important work. They facilitate an experience that can be healing. They give us tools. Mm. They support us. They push us. They encourage us. Um, that's but we do that's the huge. That is that, such a huge thing that I would just like to point out is applicable to every single aspect and modality in life. That is super poignant. I, I love that. And it's so true. Yeah. So... Um, thanks. I fully agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that's something I know so well because this is what I do with people every day. Right, right. Uh, if I'm healing them, I would know by now. <laughs> I've been doing this work for 13 years. Yeah, yeah. So, um, no, they have to be engaged in the experience to learn to tune their instrument, and it's a very difficult way. So, how can the instrument be tuned? Well, by first providing the, the body, and I'm talking about mind, body, and spirit, mm. every aspect of being, to um, source of music, or could also be in, involving visuals and many other things, but I'm going to emphasize and focus on music because music sure. is the most powerful tool. Uh, and this is why it's the only thing that you find in common in all ceremonies, all right. You know, you know whether they're indigenous setting or shamanic and uh, Eastern philosophical realms and Hinduism and Buddhism, the chants, the mantra and sutra systems, and and Western music and yeah, all music the Abrahamic the, ones, yeah, all the Abrahamic yeah. religions, precisely. So um, when we are in a situation where something so profound, like the concert you've attended, where overtone emitting instruments are being used that basically model to us how to realign with mm. source, with the complex system, the harmonic series, that's often described as the living God, mm. to to, to model to us how and what being in tune would mean like and how to be engaged. Now, there's another very important aspect that we as Westerners know very little about uh, is how to listen, the proper way of listening, mm. how to be engaged in the act of listening. We call it in the West uh, deep listening, but this is in, in certain realms, not a lot of people know what it means, but they can infer what it means. But I would, I would like to call it judicious listening. <laughs> judicious listening, intentional, attentional, keeping the mind present, getting the mind out of the way, allowing the person to focus their attention on the music. And our attention is the spotlight mm. of our mm. consciousness. Yes, yes. So when the mind wanders to just bring it back to the sound and to observe and to learn to observe things that we don't know that they're there. And we have to remember that that which is not there doesn't exist for us. Right. And it's very important to come to that awareness and to notice that which is there. And we don't know it's there, but when we start to know that it's there, many things change. <laughs> That's it, what consciousness needs to, yes. to expand. Yes, yes. A fine-tuned awareness. And, and ability to zero in on something to quiet the mind, to quiet the monkey mind. Right. To quiet the chatter, this mental diarrhea that's with us all the time. And, <laughs> and how much is connected to reality, the way we feel and the way we think, and how we create reality in, in fractal forms. Yes. So sound, if we 
really listen intentionally and that's how we listen to ancient musical cultures that continue to exist this is how we really find the deepest pleasure in listening to indian classical music that you mentioned in a bit understanding what the ragas are about right. what the talas the rhythmic modes the, the melodic modes are the ragas and uh, the rhythmic mode is the tala right so there are different divisions of time and frequency so all intervals musical intervals are mathematical ratios a fifth for example the distance between c and g or d and a mm. or f and c uh, that's a, called a perfect fifth fifth is three to two ratio a major second another interval the distance between c and d or d and e it's a nine to eight ratio so when we listen to music pure music played in non-equal tempered scales which means that we're using pure harmony or just intonations mm. uh, intonation that fits the tuning of the harmonic series we are actually using the most powerful uh, force in the world. Right. But if we don't encounter this most powerful force with our mindset, which is the intention, <laughs> right. right? The intention, the attention, the will, and the awareness, we're not going to fully benefit. This music and sound are very powerful tools, and these tools can act on us without us knowing how to perfectly use these tools. However, when we learn more and more how to use these tools to unlock the power of sound, everything changes. Right, right. So sound in this case can allow the person to vibrate sympathetically because when we're listening to these instruments or even to normal music, even music that's incapacitated, uh, there are many changes that happen in us. However, when we listen to music that's not incapacitated, we find great level of effect on our brainwave cycles that can be measured using electroencephalography, EEG. Right. And I've right. done these studies, and people can look at them on my website. And it can affect the heart rate variability, how the heart speaks to the brain and, and the heart can affect the brain more than the brain can affect the heart. This is something <laughs> that we learned about recently through Heart Math Institute research. Hmm. Sound also affects our autonomic nervous system, the system that runs the machine all, over t all the time, but it gets <laughs> affected by stress. Right. It can affect the vagus nerve, the most central nervous system. In that. And basically, uh, even our microtubules vibrate sympathetically. These are small, tiny, really, really the tiniest part in, in, in our body. They're, they're found, they're, they're conveyor belt structures that are found in the cytoplasm area, which is the area that is between the nucleus and the ectoplasm mm -hmm. in cells and neurons. So basically, um, we are designed to vibrate sympathetically with sound, pure sound. So all of these things are happening in the body, but when we give sound more at attention, eventually, if everything is right, we feel elevated, elated, yes. uh, deep in a transcendental state, even a psychedelic state, and eventually uh, start to deal with various archetypes, yes. the healer-teacher archetypes, and even the God archetype, which is inside of us, which is a form of ethos. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about identifying and relating to the archetypes and either your personal experience or just something you've noticed throughout the years? Well, they're very, very, very complex to understand. <laughs> Trust yeah. And I, I yeah. also understand that just by talking about them, you can provoke, provoke or evoke archetypes to emerge. I'm uh, abundantly yeah. aware of the, the unconscious and the collective unconscious and how these things kind of constellate in our own consciousness too. So I get it. <laughs> exactly. This is what we need to focus on. This is the only thing that will bring humanity together. Mm. Humanity they're so passionate and so misled, indoctrinated, and, and um, arrogant sometimes because of simple thing. Look of how something really profound and necessary, which is the need to want to believe in something, mm. that can cause us to be separated. Mm. And people nowadays in the world are killing each other over whose God is more merciful. Yeah, and they have been for 
for, and they for a while. For, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that should tell us about the nature of these Abrahamic religions. Yeah. And uh, people don't find that it's odd to have three different religions. But wait, even in one religion, let's say Christianity, right. you have Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy, but even within Protestantism, you have many different denominations. The same thing in Islam, you have Sunnit, Alawit, and Shiit, and Druze, which is not an offshoot that's complex. So, right. all of these divisions, categories, and subcategories, and sub subcategories. And uh, coincidentally, the, these religions, their denominations and sects, and every derivation that can come out of that, even the Mormon Church and you know everything else, Scientology. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, each group finds that uh, they're the best, and what they believe in is better than the others. That's the human detriment, the human the detriment of human belief, I should say, and that's the human condition. And there should be no judgment. It's just a very important observation mm. for us to grow up. We need to understand the human condition. We need to understand how something that is innate and s inherent and so important to us can cause us to be separated from other human beings. Right. There's a feeling of superiority that whatever we believe in is better than everyone else. Right. And I would almost argue that that might not be human nature. It is certainly feels Precisely. like that it's human nature to believe in something, but to have the cultural kind of the ultimate cultural appropriation where you then have to be elevate certain levels of things and make distinctions. Yes. That's where that stems from. And that pollutes these things. Cause like the truth is, is the, the deeper I investigate every religion, every philosophy, every mystic, whatever is going on across the, the eons, um, you can see some very pure and beautiful things in all of this. But what then you inevitably end up seeing is, a person getting their hands on this and recognizing the inherent or even relative power of these types of belief systems and then totally co-opting them and screwing it up. So I think what, what, why this becomes pragmatically useful for us is that sound is this gateway that if we tune our attention and awareness to opens up these inner mysteries within ourselves that we don't have to have something mediated by someone else. Listen, I'm, I was born Jewish. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Christ consciousness. It doesn't mean I'm going to go fight wars for Jesus because I mm -hmm. believe in him. It means that I am able to take the things that resonate with me, recognize their value as confirmation, as validation from whatever is intuitively coming out of me. And if something resonates there, that's great. But sound also gives us this direct kind of path, experiential path, I'll point out too, which is to me, that's my arbiter of truth is my direct experience. And I mean, not just my thoughts and perspective on my direct experience, but when I leave some situation, this is why psychedelics have such a profound effect on so many people is you, that was happening. <laughs> you know, you can uh -huh. write it off as a hallucination as much as you want, but you experience that and it sticks with you because of that. So I mean, I find this to be at the, the the literal nexus of what I'm interested in my life because I have naturally uh, gravitated towards sound and music and also intuitively um, and luckily, you know, downloaded in my brain somehow some of these ideas that you're speaking about. And they certainly, as time goes on linearly, at least, seem to continue to line up. I mean, the, the synchronicities I've had with sound, music, numbers, archetypes alone. I mean, it's enough to fill a book. So I find this, this is just totally fascinating. I mean, what there's, I, I want to touch on some of the questions you sent over too, because they just stood out to me. But what you mentioned something in one of the questions about disinformation and misinformation in sound. And I'd be interested mm -hmm. to hear what your thoughts on thoughts are on that. Yes. Well, first of all, I'm in full agreement with everything you said. And <laughs> Uh, the, the three most powerful things that can engage the person in exploring the divine, being with God, and these are tools that humans have always used up until recently, and some of them became banned, and the others became modified, um, are uh, compounds, which are chemicals, mm. psychedelics, plant teachers, whatever you want to call them. Sound is the second one. 
<clears throat> and of course, music comes out of that. Hmm. And phenomenology. And you can include in there meditation, mindfulness, contemplation, hmm. which is the act of observation. Hmm. And the direct experience is the most powerful thing. However, if we know, if we learn more how to be in the direct experience, how to observe, right. how not to label things, <laughs> right, how, to be, right, right. how to be open, curious, non-judgmental, and attentive, judicious, and able to understand by being an experience and not have to worry about wanting to put it in a phrase, uh, then we can experience uh, the divine, right. the concept of God. Now, this doesn't happen so much because we are indoctrinated, we are mind-controlled, and this is what we have to grow out of. This um, straight jacket now we are wearing and think that it's an ornament, and that's what causes people to kill each other over whose God is more merciful. So we are not, it's not something that we do automatically, right. but because of our conditioning, uh, this is happening to us. And that's something that I can talk a lot about, and, mm. and thanks for bringing this aspect out, that it's not just in human condition, this is where we are, but it's also people who know more than others, and these people, we can call them the elite or the 1% or um, far less than 1%. Um, and um, those who are in control uh, basically are dumbing down society and right. conditioning people. And um, so basically, um, how does this happen in various ways? Um, well, Part of the human condition is to observe that when we know very little, we tend to brag and boast about how much we know <laughs> and what we believe in, in our ability to heal. Uh, sound healing is not a term I would use. I would never call myself a sound healer. Is I know what people mean by it, and right. I can understand that this is the commonly used term. Right. But I always gently correct people that this is not the most appropriate term. Very briefly, here is why. I've written a piece on it. Yeah, yeah. People can read it on my uh, website. It's called, uh, why not just call it sound healing? So, mm. <clears throat> because sound healing means that someone is healing someone else. We don't know if it's the practitioner or the heater, God forbid, or the sound itself, but it does not engage the person in the experience as an active participant. Right. So it's a little bit gimmicky. It promises a lot in doing very little or nothing. I call it what it is, sound therapy or sound meditation, which is better, which means the person receiving is engaged in the experience. And the best way to do so is to be an active participant, to be listening, <clears throat> to learn how to use the tools, right. to quiet the mind, so on and so forth. I can also talk a lot about this aspect. But So um, because people are so passionate and they want to help others, some people may go and take a workshop in sound healing on a Saturday afternoon or over a weekend or over a week, and they become sound healers and <laughs> masters, <clears throat> or even in Reiki. <clears throat> right. Reiki master is something that people can get over a weekend right. or two weekends or, let's say, a month maximum. I'm still a master you know, over a month. How is that? I mean, this is preposterous. How can right. we accept this? Where is it coming from? Well, the desire the desire to want to help others to feel good about the self. So the ego becomes right. involved very easily. So we need to awaken from that. We need to realize that uh, <clears throat> for us to be lost, is the good hegemonic system has to involve, involve us in the process so that we can act in that system, propel it, and, um, and use it against ourselves and defend it even. So our ego can empower these systems that create the disinformation, the social engineering, and the social design. Take, for example, this. Um, so, so many people now are debating whether 440 hertz <laughs> is the modified version of what it should be, which should be 432 hertz, right, right. which means starting the tuning of A on 432 hertz instead of 440 hertz. Right. Um, 
because of the mathematics, blah, blah, blah. Uh, possibly, maybe. We need more studies. I'm not against that. Uh, I am skeptical. I like more studies and not just someone's conjecture yeah conjecture or confabulation or uh, some conjuring up of uh, <laughs> data or pure passion for example right <clears throat> to to release things but they're based on either wishful thinking and wishful believing which can turn into misinformation or release things with the intention to mislead people, which can become disinformation. Mm. So the reason why I think that the 432 versus 440 hertz is disinformation or misinformation or both, because it's not the most important thing. Right. The most important thing that no one is talking about, or very, very, very few people are talking about, um, is the fact that what we need to address is equal tempered octave versus non-equal tempered octave. The effect of an equal tempered octave is dramatically more impactful than non-equal temperament. Mm. That means you're not going to lose the state of trance. You're not going to be separated from the most powerful force in nature and the universe. Sound, which is vibration, energy and frequency in Nikola Tesla, just as a reminder, yes. said, if you want to understand the universe, think of vibration, frequency, and energy, and sound is all three. So sound is the most powerful force in the universe, but also the most the destructive. He yes. also added that if you want to split the earth in two halves, you need to find the prime resonant frequency. Right. So uh, basically, 432 versus 440 is very, very minimally important, but not nearly as important as what we need to research. Something such as e the detriment of equal temperament. There's a great book called How Equal Temperament Ruined Harmony and Why You Should Care. Mm. It's really wonderful. So people need to learn more about that and not just about 432 versus 440. This, I'm not saying that 440 is the better frequency, and I'm not saying it's... Let's move on. It's not important. That it misses it, it, the point a bit. It misses right. the point. Right. No, it, it, it can be important, but it's not as important. And people may not understand why I'm saying this, because it's quite convoluted. And we tend to <laughs> shy away from anything that's difficult. And we tackle the, the little thing that we can. People have no clue how difficult it is to delve deep into sound studies, the level of abstruse mathematics that one has to deal with, with acoustics, with um, biochemistry, with neuroscience and phenomenology, f f philosophy and ontology, so many things. I mean, that's right. why I keep on saying that the best way to understand sound is to take a multidisciplinary approach. So these are all very important matter matters and people have to become we are forced to become better researchers if we want to understand the difference between believing in the right thing and the wrong thing and how much um, it'll save us time and energy. We need to <laughs> research yeah. things and not just take someone else's word, even a good friend, even an intelligent person, even if you want to be on the right track, don't follow the majority. Because the majority <laughs> is being misled. It's, this has been my motto for many years and it's been working, I hope. I get to a point where this motor doesn't work anymore, but yeah, so far luck. it's working. <laughs> yeah, people can research, you know, and all these things about chakras and their correlation to notes. There is no evidence. I'm sorry. Mm. Mm. This is this is based on wishful thinking and wishful believing, or things taken out of context, or some someone mentioned something in Indian music, but then if we compare Indian musical system with the tibetan realize that oh different notes affect different chakras and right. so who's five right? chakras versus seven <clears throat> first how many chakras first of all are talking about seven the yeah customer, or are they going to be 12 or are they going to be the the million the thousands of them yeah i mean yes. it's it's a complex system that if we just start pulling pieces from every which way to form yeah. a story that makes sense to us um, isn't really going to work. That's not to say there isn't some underlying no. unity behind it, of course. It's just that it, it is wise to be um, precau take the necessary precautions to, to, right. rather than just weaving something together. And I found that out 
myself in my own life. I consider myself uh, someone who believes in a lot of different <laughs> things. Um, some of those beliefs have fallen off and some of those beliefs were constructed in retrospect, looking at things that I wanted to believe. So I think that the more experience, that's a learning experience, just to be clear, like it doesn't mean caution yourself, don't believe in anything. That's, I think, the exact wrong approach. However, there is some validity. And I think the people who are really delving into this stuff, what, what, what struck me when you were saying that people are eager to believe things that are much more simple than complex, it's how many people subscribe to Freudian theories versus Jungian mm -hmm. theories. The reason yes. is it's very simple. And anyone who's read any amount of Jung knows this. It's the densest shit in the entire world. It's it's mm -hmm. painstakingly written and researched and oh my God. And it's much easier to be like, oh, everything is related to sex and our parents. I'm going to mm -hmm. go with that. So it's yes. just like there are layers to this. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily dive as deep as you and I or someone else. It just means that you and I are interested in getting into discovering the relationship between the modality of sound and these spiritual, physical, emotional benefits that that can have in a practical sense. So this maybe can uh, evoke enlightened and transcendental states, but I, I think we still live in the world. While we're here, we use these things practically. So I want, uh, we're, I, I'm going to end with three questions, then I have one big question. Alex, Alexandria, I would love to do this uh, again sometime too. Where are you located? In New York City. Okay, great. So I'm yeah. actually about to head into the city in a couple hours. Um, uh -huh. I'm, I'm about two hours north in the Hudson Valley, but okay. I would love to potentially do another one of these. We can set it up off air um, because this uh -huh. has been fantastic. It's been a wonderful conversation. So yeah. let, me, uh, let me ask you my quick questions here. So what is your favorite color? Huh. Um, it changes. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Between blue and orange. Oh, cool. I like both, actually. I'm drawn to both. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I like that juxtaposition there. Uh, what is your favorite number? I don't have one. Any one that you pops in your head right now? Uh, 12. There you go. That was actually the last one someone said, and it's the first time I had heard it, and I commented on it. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite animal? Um, <laughs> meerkat. <laughs> cool. That's the first time somebody says meerkat. Meerkats are awesome. <laughs> I love their curiosity, intelligence, and uh, camaraderie, and this familiar sense they have. And and uh, yeah, that's awesome. And they're they're cute and funny, and yeah, <laughs> that's so great. That's a really great answer. All right, and last question: What's a practical tip? Um, that is, you could share with people listening that's helped you in your life? Whoa. It's easier for me to rattle a couple, <laughs> of, dozens, a couple of dozens than one. <laughs> you and me both. Say as many as you feel appropriate. Huh? Say as many as you feel appropriate. Yeah, I'm okay. not going to make you pick. Sure. Uh, be curious. Um, exercise your intuition to a greater level than you think you have it. Um, follow your heart, or as Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. Observe very attentively how you use your time and energy. Mm. And be skeptical. <laughs> and use your imagination oh, really? to a greater level than what you normally experience. So I'm going to say those are the best <laughs> tips I think anyone has given at the end of this. And I've done 90 some of these. So oh, amazing. Wow. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Alexander, so much for doing this. We'll be in touch soon. I'll let you know when it comes out. Um, and I'll have I'll reach out to you about any links or things you would want me to promote on the episode page or the intros. But really, this has been such a pleasure. And I'm really grateful and thankful to Michael Phillip for introducing us. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you very much, Noah. It was awesome. a pleasure to be on the show. Cool. We'll Thanks. talk soon. Okay, doke. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Ciao.
Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal in a comfort And if you do a party, invited everyone you knew. You would see the biggest gift would be from me And the card attached would say Thank you for being a bear Wow! How's that for sound and music? Thank you for listening to this episode. I will see you next week. Thank you, Patrick, for being an awesome Patreon supporter. Uh, Bye-bye.